Huh. What's this? Professor Mirror's calling me? On Discord? <sighs> Looks like we're gonna have to see what he wants. Hey! I heard you were restarting the Anarchy Analysis series for MSI. And I figured you need a new bid, so why don't you go and capture pictures of Pokemon for me? Well, let's go find that camera. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the EU Talent Factory, also known as the EU Masters Finals. We have a good one, and this is something I did not expect we would have, as it is a surprising return to the Anarchy Analysis series, and they haven't been in one of these episodes since 2019. It is BTXL, and they're taking on their opponents, who are making their debut to this series in Cayman Corp. Now, this series is going to be an absolute blast, so without further ado, let's get into it. So, game one is firmly in Casey's hands, they are 10k up, Baron also in their grasp, and they're sitting nicely on Soul Point, looking to pick it up once the Drake spawns. But leads are sometimes misleading, and when your Hecarim goes running through the mid lane on a very greedy path, and gets caught out, it is bye bye Mr. Horsey as a lovely lantern gets denied due to Marku's control wall placement, basically saying bye bye Mr. Horsey and bye bye Locket of the Iron Solari from the Thresh's inventory. Excel tried to chase onto the fleeing Thresh, but knowing he can just blast code away to safety, they give up that chase pushing him far enough away so that they can collapse onto the Darius who went back to split pushing once his jungler died and this to me is kind of a reckless maneuver as he is on the side of all of XL and as such they have an easy access to him even though the destiny reveals XL's position. Then XL secured a drink for themselves as Adam is forced to come to them as he has no out tools and as such, Tom Kench tries to cut him off with the Abyssal Voyage, but goes kind of a little bit too far. But that does not stop the deadly Medley. Using the Zap Cannon, he is able to keep Thresh out of hook range, or flay range, on the Udia or himself, and it forces the Lantern Bearer to flash forward in order to try and lock up the carry. However, he is a little chunk from being poked down earlier from Jinx, and the Super Mega Deathfire rocket and one of Fishbone's rockets takes him out, and XL fans all, along with Jinx, get excited. Forcing the Aphelios to flash out, he does manage to root the Jinx though, which means the Darius can get close to him and try to punish this player. However, she can just press cleanse to get out of the root, then with only her Legends Bloodline rune to sustain her health, she is able to kite the Darius and pick up another kill, shutting down K Corp's steamroll of this game, and in the end, Game 1 is coming home for the United Kingdom representatives. And with that, let's check in on our Pokemon Snap adventure. Right, let's get my camera. Oh. There we go. Time to go get me some Pokemon. Glad to see the adventure is going well. Now, on to game two, and it is very similar to game one. Keiko controlling the early through mid game, and XL claiming the late half of it. However, one slip up changes the outcome of this match this time. And it happens in the top lane. Once again, you have to think about the greed of players. Thriving for a win that's 
been 45 minutes in, it's been quite a long time, and usually you, you see mistakes around this part of the game, and Deadly is on the receiving end of a mistake. In essence, on his Jinx, the XL charge for the inhib turret, but he steps a bit too close to Olaf who hits an undertone, and Corky who comes barreling in with the extra movement speed from the package, rocketing him and chunking him quite low. As such, this signals to KC, hey, this is a chunked ADC, we can fight here and pop him. Especially once the Tom Kent uses his Devour very early because of all this poke damage. So he uses it, chucks it out deadly, a bit further away, but this signals go time for K Corp. Hecker fears up from the Onslaught of Shadows for members of XL. And then it's the Corgi package on top of that, layering in a lot of damage onto the Fear Jinx who drops like a sack of spuds. And what's more, Hecarim is an absolute beast in this fight. I would say the MVP of this game, and his devastating charge knocks Hatrix into a patient Thrash, who waits for the stopwatch in vulnerability to run out on the Ori, so that the both big backline carries for Excel are taking, taken out, and K Corp can clean up XL's frontline with minimal casualties as Corky, who has a big package launched himself into all of XL, that usually does mean night night big Corky, who's got no protection in essence. But one by one, XL's members fall to X Maddie's Aphelios, leaving just the volley to helplessly defend the blue side base. And in the end, the LFL Blue Wall stood tall and won game two of this series. It's hard to believe that there's no Pokemon outside. Like, why is there none anywhere I look? Jesus, we, we need to probably look a bit better at this stuff. Yeah. That guy is so oblivious. Anywho, let's rack up another tune and head into game three, where we end up seeing a close game that breaks open when a Diffy and a Teamy arises in the mid lane, in which, in this team fight breakdown, we will be focusing on. So, let's kick it off. Both teams scurrying around the Baron, an XL little chunk after they started the Purple Snake. Now, this little scurry forces the Bromel and Saken uses this as a chance to land the E mark onto him. Then, E2 plus R1 is activated, and this forces the locket to be used by XL support as well as the exhaust onto Saken. But what's more, he's also hit by a swirl seed and is put to sleep in the shroud as Louie and Braum attempt to flee from the fight. However, obviously, R1 of Akali's ultimate has been used to close the gap, and as such, when the R2 free movement spell is used, he closes the gap onto the Lilia, Q into E1 and E2, onto the Fall, picking up the first kill for his team, while all four of the remaining members kill the crocodile. k -Corp turned to Baron themselves, and in the time Saken resets as XL tried to contest the Baron take, but a swift TP back from Saken gets behind the XL members, and as such they try to turn it onto him. However, the concussive blow stack do not get stacked up. And to this allows Saken to get away with the E, and once the Baron buff is gained, the immediate E2 from him, and Pop goes to Braum, and 
FK Cup pick up three from this god forsaken play. God, it's so hard to find these Pokemon. Like, outside, nothing. Bathroom, nothing. Though I wouldn't expect a Pokemon to be in my bathroom. Even my room. Like, I give up. Professor Mirror's gonna be a shame, but I tried. I, I <laughs> Well, you probably know by now we're not breaking down a team fight in game four. In fact, we're just gonna be breaking down everything coming into this matchup. And oh boy, this is gonna be fun. And obviously, if you don't know, I'm UK based. I obviously was supporting in this matchup the UK team in BTXL. First time an NLC team slash UKLC team made it to the finals. The last team that probably had a really good run in EU Masters was Fnatic Rising or the Renegade Banditos, if you're going back that long. But this matchup for me was very interesting, I would say. You have two teams that realistically have the same sort of style. XL love to play through top and bot. Deadly and Arome. They are the big carries and we saw that in their previous best of three that got them into the final. And the mid and jungle for XL like to set up the rest of their team. Hattricks you don't really see as a big carry. He's more of a setup player like Caps minus the big killing sprees that he just roams and gets killed like that. It's a less of that and more set up for Deadly and Aroma. However, K Corp side of things, you would say they're a bit more rounded and sharper version of XL. Yes, Adam does tend to have in games, quite big in games. He isn't as strong as Aroma, I would say. But, the rest of the map. Ma X Maddie and Targmas have played together for a long time. They played together on Fnatic Rising, if you don't know. I was analysing during that time when they did. Saken is, I'd honestly say, better than Hatrix in this series and in the previous best of three series that got K Corp into the finals. Because he picks up the kills. He is more of the kill, big late game threat that K Corp like to play with. And he's more of an interesting style. And probably, if we have this thing where K-Corp are going to stay together on life. What we want, we want these players in the LEC. Probably you would see Saken picked back up to an LEC roster. But that's a bit of a hit or miss if K-Corp stick together or not. And there was also a big difference in the jungle, I would say, in this series. Syncroft with the tankier picks, the Udia he popped off on. Stealing away Marcoon's Pekarim. Pekarim being a pick he played 9 out of. So many games he played Pekarim a lot, Marcoon. And realistically, you didn't get to see too much of his pool. Though, he's a very selfless jungle. He sets up for the map, as I said. In this series, he just couldn't do that as... Syncroft essentially out-jungled him, beat him to every camp. Granted, the objective sway wasn't too big, I would say. Only the fact that k -Corp prioritized these early drakes, got themselves the big objectives, and in game one, I do actually have a note that k -Corp had very good quick rotations to take the objectives or after objectives to get themselves plays and you can kind of see in game one XL panic at 20 minutes you saw Hatrix getting caught out there was quite a bit of stress and nerves and the pressure for all of these games and when you get to the late game carry XL took over deadly hits his scale and pops off and goes big for himself and in my notes I started changing my tone of how I was writing it. I went from lowercase all the way through to when Deadly popped off on his jinx, full caps, because 
it's the turning point of the game. You know it's turning. When the Jinx is able to pick up a double kill, shutting down two people, which was our game one breakdown. That signifies to me that XL, if they know how to play the late game, they play it very well. But when you Jinx is getting a bit too anti, like Deadly did in game two, it gives an easy back in for k -Corp. And they know how to jump on it. Especially when they have the frontline, the top and jungle frontliners, who are just so damn bulky to stand in front of you, slow you down, and then immediately pop and clean out the corky. That was a very good play for them to take off. Realistically, the styles kind of just change very slightly in how these two teams play. Take up very early, XL very late. They both have the same sort of ways to set up for their style. And when you drag out K-Corp normally to late game, it's very easy to smash a team because they draft quite early. Olaf, very early game champion. They picked it top lane. Not in the jungle, top. Yes, Adam plays Darius. Yes, he plays Olaf. He plays a lot of these unique picks, but it doesn't matter. They did well. Take up the XL in three out of the five games. Who cares? And with that, we can end this episode off here. Bit of a long run here for me to end it off, but I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like down below. Subscribe to me around here if you want to. I'll be seeing you for MSI in the upcoming days as well. Peace out. God, it's so hard to find these Pokemon. Like, outside, nothing. Bathroom, nothing. Though I wouldn't expect a Pokemon to be in my bathroom. Even my room. Like, I give up. Professor Mirror's gonna be a shame, but I tried. I, I tried. <laughs>